Welcome again to George Washington Speaks. I'm Tom Saffold. George Washington grew up as a farm boy in Tidewater, Virginia. He came to love that light, and despite his many other accomplishments, considered himself a planter at heart. Listen as George Washington, portrayed by Vern Frickholm, describes his lifelong connection to the land. I was born at my father's Pope Creek Plantation on February 11th, 1732, by the old Julian calendar. But by the new calendar, it was February 22nd, 1732, and it has been reckoned as such ever since. Growing up at the Pope Creek Plantation for three years, and then the Little Hunting Creek Plantation for another three years, I learned to love the land and everything that it produced. Both of my father's plantations were like little towns. My father worked with the overseers of each plantation and the iron furnace and made sure that they had everything that they needed to run smoothly. My mother was more concerned with the running of the food and clothing, cleanliness and repair of the home the planting, weeding, and harvesting of the kitchen gardens, and nurturing, educating, and training the children. Both of my parents had strong beliefs, personalities, and loyalties, and they had high hopes for their six children, and I might add what they wanted me, their eldest son, to do could seem to be too much. However, even as a young boy, I knew what they wanted me to do would help them keep track of the younger children and would set a good example for them to follow. I can't recall ever doubting their wisdom and love for me and my siblings. But I do recall many, many times that I didn't like being the eldest of six children. I felt that I needed to obey my parents. I remember not doing many, many things that I wanted to do because it would not set a good example for them. I look back and I credit that obedience, that training as good preparation to be a leader in the Virginia House of Burgesses, as a general in the Continental Army, and even as president of a government that had never been tried before, a government of we, the people. As a leader in the government and army and as the eldest of six children, I see that those early years of our lives do much to form our character. The decisions made when we are young, choosing whether we will obey or do right, form our character. When we would rather do what we want to do, but choose to do what is best for those that we are responsible for, forms our character and influences who we will become as adults. Will we always think about ourselves or will we put what is best for our families or our country before what we want to do? I always tried to select young men of that type of good character to serve with me in the army and in the government. But I must confess that even though I grew up in a loving and wise family that helped me develop good character, I still made some childish and unwise decisions. True, many of those bad decisions that I made in my teen years and as a young man would continue to bother me all my life. And yet again, many of the good decisions I made as a young boy would have consequences that absolutely no one could foresee. Would we dare to think that the decisions of one unknown young boy in Virginia would change the future of a nation? <laughs> I, I think not. But the same is true of any child. The choices made in youth develop the man or the woman that they become. As early as age six in 1738, I just assumed that my life's future as a Washington would be as a plantation owner. I felt a love for the land and a bond with it, as did my father, grandfather, great-grandfather, 
and my two older half-brothers. Everything we needed to live on was grown in the soil or fished from the water and washed and cooked in a way that met all of our food needs. The wood to build our house, barn and sheds and other things, that is the roof, the fences, carts, tools and plows, all came from our forest lands. The herbs, vegetables and crops grew in our own soil. The eggs, milk, cheese, and meat came from our own chickens and cows and pigs. The water, ale, and wine came from our wells and their fermentation. And we grew the grain and food for all of the animals. Our family was at the center of our plantation community. And we hired workers such as carpenters, masons, blacksmiths, and wheelwrights to make horseshoes, axe heads, tools, nails, plows, wheels, and other farm implements. Our indentured servants and slaves provided the labor to use those tools as field hands to work the crops and in the home to make linens such as dining room linens, bed she sheets, pillows, and clothing. We worked together and everybody played their part. We were dependent upon and complemented each other. Both my father and mother were hard workers and they were disciplinarians. They had to be on a plantation with six kids. We all knew our place and for the most part functioned well to make ends meet. I can't recall ever thinking about the privileged position that I had or the difficult life that the slaves had, but those thoughts would come as I got older and gained more life experience. I remember in those earlier years I was happier and more content living close to the ground than I have ever been at any time in my life. I often said that no matter where I was called, to serve the colonies later in life, I always wish to come back to the plantation. All through the eight years of the Revolutionary War and the eight years of the presidency, I repeated that I just wanted to come back to the plantation to be under my own vine and fig tree. <laughs> now, that phrase came from a favorite part of scripture found in Micah 4.4, which said, but they shall all sit under their own vine and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. As I understand the phrase, the peasant, simple farmer of that age, who did not have to serve in the military or do lots of things for the king, could enjoy the simple, rewarding life of farming. It seemed to me to be a good thought for the average American colonist, since that is why most of them came to the colonies. It is what motivated them to make the hard and long trip from Europe to the colonies. Then, when the English king and government tried to demand more from the colonists, they were willing to fight them to keep the kind of life they and their families had worked hard to create. As I'm recounting to you my story, I'm sitting at Mount Vernon under my own vine and fig tree. So you see, I have reached my life's goal. George Washington loved the agricultural life, but we know he did much more than that. In the next edition, he will share some of the influences of Britain and the colonies that affected life in America.